The King Tiger, or the Tiger II as it was also known, was the step up from the Tiger tank. It was a super heavy breakthrough tank with a more powerful gun and an insane level of armour protection. This was also to be the wonder weapon which would fill the tank needs for the German forces, but as we will see, it did anything but that. Development of the King Tiger started as soon as the original Tiger was even on the battlefield, as the Tiger I was a rush design built to counter the Soviet T-34 and KV-1 series. The King Tiger was to be the full potential of the heavy breakthrough tank idea. The earliest start for designs relating to the King Tiger was October 1941, where the testing of the 8.8cm KWK L71 gun was placed into the turret of a tank chassis, but due to problems with the engines and the suspension of this design, it was cancelled. But after many companies collaborated and many different designs had been cycled through, the first King Tigers were produced by October 1942. These were the prototypes, and after evaluation, the successful models led to a total of 487 being produced by the end of the war, which was a relatively small number of tanks, as the original order was a total of 1,234, but due to material shortages and air raids on industry, the industry could not keep up with the high war demand. The armour of the King Tiger was insane to be honest, with maximum protection from heavy anti-tank weapons being the priority, and with Adolf Hitler himself demanding the armour be increased during the original design, the King Tiger ended up with the following armour. Gun mantler 180mm, upper front 150mm, lower front 110mm, upper side 85mm, rear 80mm, hull roof 40mm, turret side 80mm, turret roof 44mm, floor 40mm under the fighting compartment, and 25mm under the engine. This armour was all but impervious but to the most powerful anti-tank guns, and it was found by the Soviets in testing that firing 122mm and larger HE rounds to disable the tank drives was easier than attempting to penetrate the King Tiger's armour. Also in testing by the Soviets, they found that the metal composition of the armour was inferior to that of the Panther and the Tiger I, most likely due to resource shortages and even with these extremely thick armour plates, they were prone to cracking. Unfortunately, even though designed to be impenetrable, this could only be achieved if you can build to the quality that is needed. This huge amount of armour was also extremely heavy, with the King Tiger at combat weight weighing 68 tonnes, which put huge strain on the engine, suspension and pretty much every component in the tank. The main armament of the King Tiger was the massive 8.8 centimetres KWK-43 L-71 main gun. This giant slayer could penetrate a T-34 from over 2,000 metres away and was capable of knocking out even the mighty IS-2 within 500 metres. No tank was safe, even at great distance, as the weapon could fire out accurately up to 6,000 metres, and this is the same weapon mounted on the Elephant Tank Destroyer. It also had the standard coaxial MG-34 and hull-mounted MG-34 to deal with light infantry threats, and just like later model, models of the Tiger I, it was fitted with the close defence weapon known as the S-Mine Launcher, which could fire HE, smoke and flare ammunition depending on the situation. The mobility of the King Tiger was an opposite story to the armour and armament. From the start, this beast weighed around 68 tonnes at combat weight, which caused massive stress on the engines and suspension. This was very obvious to the crews, as when they first had a chance to drive them, the listed top speed was 25 miles per hour but most reports suggest that they were only able to get up to 18.5 miles per hour on a well-maintained tarmac road and as little as 9 miles per hour off-road. And if the ground was soft, only 7 miles per hour, meaning the King Tiger was slow and an easy target and ineffective at battlefield manoeuvres. Another problem was due to the massive weight. When sharp turns and steering manoeuvres were performed, this exacerbated the stresses and would cause the drive to fail. Drive shafts would twist and break. There was simply too much weight for it to handle, and this caused huge amounts of mechanical failures. One such one was in P Heavy Panzer Battalion 506, which reported in September 1944, after fighting in Arnhem, that after just 50 to 100 kilometers of travel, its tanks, a full battalion strength of 45 Tiger IIs, aka the King Tiger, had suffered 12 major mechanical failures, meaning over 25% were out of action just from traveling a relatively short distance. But most importantly, how did this super heavy tank fare in combat? Well, the first combat deployment of the King Tiger was July 1944 on the Western Front, and straight away mechanical problems were plaguing them 
with many heavy panzer battalions being under strength immediately, as the King Tigers were suffering massive amounts of mechanical failures, which did not go down well with the crews and commanders. In combat, they did poorly, mainly due to their poor manoeuvrability, with a King Tiger command tank being disabled by falling into an artillery crater. But when the King Tiger was able to get into a decent position, its heavy armour and massive gun was unparalleled, and on the Western Front, where heavily armed tanks like the Sherman Jumbo and Firefly were in short supply, there was very little they could do against the massive King Tiger. The King Tiger's first deployment on the Eastern Front also did not fare well, as in August 1944, Heavy Panzer Battalion 501 was advancing towards Sidlow, where they were ambushed by 3-4 to four T-34-85s, which knocked out three of the King Tigers, mainly due to the ammunition detonating inside the turret. This actually led to the crews being told not to store spare ammunition in the turret, which led to less ammunition being carried overall. This was not the only problem at Sidlow, as of the 45 King Tigers issued, only 26 were left operational by September, and many were lost simply to mechanical failures and due to the lack of sufficient recovery vehicles. And when King Tigers were mobilised, many had to be destroyed by their crews, and by the end of the war it's estimated more King Tigers were destroyed by their own crews to avoid them being captured, than by the direct actions of the enemy, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, to be honest. After the initial engagements, the King Tigers' luck did not increase. Even when they were sent to Arnhem to push back British forces in the failed Operation Market Garden, despite heavily outnumbering the enemy and having vastly superior forces, a lightly armed British paratrooper unit was able to knock out a King Tiger with a simple British pier launcher. The King Tiger was just too slow, unreliable, and its immense presence would attract all the anti-tank fire available, meaning if the armour could not be penetrated, the tracks would be targeted, and once disabled, artillery or airstrikes could finish the King Tiger off. As more experience of fighting the King Tiger was gained, the Allies learnt that due to the stress the vehicle's weight put on the hull, large high-explosive weapons could cause massive mechanical failures and render the tank immobile and extremely vulnerable. By the end of the war, the King Tiger proved to be an ambitious project that used a lot of valuable resources and skilled industry to make a super heavy tank that failed to deliver. Even though its armour and armament was tremendous, its inability to manoeuvre around the battlefield and its mechanical unreliability meant it was a failure of a super heavy tank. And most engagements resulted in failures with very few successes. And if the Germans had used these resources to keep producing more Tiger Ones or Panther tanks, the war would have most likely still been lost, but thousands more useful tanks could have been produced to help the Germans in the defence of the Reich. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and you guys have a fantastic evening.